It's the next level. Hey, my name is Ross Marquand and I play Red Skull. You are listening to Panels to Pixels podcast. Check it out. Reruns. I'll show her a goddamn rerun. You, that's the temperature gauge in that corner. What's the current reading? 48 degrees. Turn it down to 22. Exactly 22. What the fuck are you doing? Baby squids. I designed them to be harmless, to dissolve shortly after impact. No reason to incur damage and casualties, but if I freeze them before transport, it'll be like firing a Gatling gun from the heavens. Do you think we'll really be able to save John? Oh, I'm sure John's dead already. But we have a window of opportunity while her precious quantum the centrifuge prepares his energy for transfer. Transfer into what? Into a most worthy adversary. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And tonight we have a special guest with us. Say hi. It's Kyle. <laughs> Kyle. Hey, it's Kyle. From Fear the Walking Dead Talk Through. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Kyle. Awesome. No problem. Thank you for having me on. We love Kyle. He's family. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Aw. So what, what is the name of this episode tonight, Mark? Well, tonight's episode that we'll be covering will be Watchmen Season 1, Episode 9, See How They Fly. And the synopsis basically states, everything ends for real this time. And what? <laughs> <laughs> I like the short synopsis, though. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what do you guys think about that idea of that short synopsis though? Oh, I love it. I you know, this 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 finale was was incredible. I I, I can't wait to get into the discussion because I, I think Damien Lindelof wrapped it up just incredibly well. It leaves us you know, it leaves us with uh it's kind of an open ended kind of thing, just like the the comic book series did. You know, the, the comic book series ended literally like the last two pages is a squid attack on New York. And we yeah. have no clue what's going to happen after that. And we just have Lori and uh, Dan Dryberg flying away from Karnak. And that's it. It's it's That's where the comic book ends. So uh, this show kind of does the same thing. It ends and leaves it open for you to, to have your imagination. Yeah, no, I, that's... I mean, I, I, I'm I coming from, like, not having read the comics or really know much about the comics. So, like... I didn't even really know that there wasn't going to be a new episode or a new season until probably about a, like a week and a half, or probably like a week or so ago. And then when this came through and it was that, you know, that final scene, I was like, wait, no, like this, this makes no sense. Like, how are you going to have a show that everybody <laughs> is talking about as being like the most amazing thing ever? And you're going to be like, okay, time to move on. <laughs> so I, I we'll see, but yeah, it's, this that that synopsis basically sums up the whole like <laughs> the whole the whole thing. <laughs> uh what were your first takes on the actual episode? My first takes the music has to be I think something throughout the whole entire like season. It's just the music in this was so spot on, I think. Like I don't know what like who who was in charge of this, but it was like it almost just made the whole thing feel so like almost like operatic, you know, and like epic and like you were watching like some amazing like story. And uh, to me, I'm like, I, I come from a music background and it's like, I just feel like that's one of the things that doesn't seem to get highlighted enough because that's what makes you like feel things. That's what makes you, you know, think about what you're seeing and you know, how, how it comes across. But it just, that, I don't know, like, Yes, all the stuff that happened, which we'll be talking about, you know, I'm sure later. But um, the music, I think I just want to highlight is like that they <laughs> did so such a good job with what they picked and how they used it. And yeah, it, that was awesome. Yeah, we saw we saw that throughout, you know, throughout, like you said, throughout the whole season, we've seen that. And I think Mark and I specifically, we talked about it a lot in the the flash, the 
was it a flashback episode? The the episode where um when um I can't believe her name is totally escaping me. The <laughs> main and angela <laughs> thank you angela was under the, the under the, uh, the oh, nostalgia yeah. <laughs> drug and she's remembering her grandfather's she's seeing her grandfather's memories and the way the music played into that was was just amazing and then the same with the dr manhattan episode where we got to see the that music there and then this one and uh i think uh you're you hit the nail on the head kyle that uh, trent reznor from nine inch nails i didn't know much about him before this i knew i mean mm. i know the band nine inch nails but i don't know much about them but uh, he apparently is a rather prolific oh yeah uh, musician and composer and has done a lot of scores and and for mm -hmm. tv shows and movies so oh definitely he is definitely a uh, a music icon that actually worked within the show and it wasn't something that i tapped onto until this last episode and i posted that i think on our facebook page which is amazing. But for you, Kyle, so coming from that perspective, because we've, we've tried to find out about this perspective of, of not having the comic books, was there, was there things that were confusing to you or did it all end up making sense eventually? I, yeah, in the beginning, I had no idea what was going on. Like, I, I didn't understand, like, the universe. I didn't know, like, you know like why they were doing what they were doing. And then you started adding on like, you know, Dr. Manhattan or like, or just a, uh, even uh, like Lady True. It was kind of like, okay, that's a f interesting person. But I'm like, I have no idea what you fit and like how this works. And, you know, like then there's like this whole other side that's like, oh, the FBI. And then, you know, it's like they're coming in to, I guess, wearing masks or being like a, a vigilante. It was like, I didn't get any of that. I was kind of like, okay. But as each episode played out and, you know, was continuing, like they built upon kind of those elements that you started to understand more. And then, you know, besides the fact that it was wonderfully acted and like the dialogue and the music and all that stuff, it was really enjoyable. And it was almost kind of like a, I felt like I was kind of in this, like a, not like a who done it, but just like this, you know, it's like every episode just peeled another layer and I started to kind of like start getting it more or like, like, you know, I started to understand, Oh, this universe, like kind of how it was working. And then it just kept adding and adding and adding to yeah. obviously we get to the end and I was already fully like, you know, into it. And then it just like turned into this most amazing thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. I'm glad to hear that. Cause that's, that's, that's one thing that, that was hard for Mark and I, cause we didn't have that perspective of, of being fans of the movie and being fans of the comic book uh, from going way back. We, we understood what was going on with the squids. We understood when they talked about Robert Redford being president, that that was, that was a thing mm -hmm. from the comic books, you know? And uh, so that, that's good to hear that somebody who didn't have, didn't really have a comic book knowledge was still able to kind of follow. Yeah. <laughs> Just went with it. And it, it oh, and definitely. It, it was, well, actually we had a conversation with a friend of ours. Uh, like she was, she's house sitting for me. Um, later or whatever and she was like okay well it's like was there anything good on tv or whatever and we both me and my husband will turn we're like watchmen and she's like oh really what's it about and it's like <laughs> well it's kind of this and we were trying to explain it and we were like totally getting lost ourselves and we were like okay just just watch it and she's like well she's or i was like okay but like just keep watching it like you're, the first second third episode you might be like what is going on and i was like stick with it because then it starts all making sense and starts like you know you start understanding more and then it just, it keeps, it's just amazing. <laughs> so I think turn, she's yeah, going yeah. to probably watch it when we're gone. <laughs> yeah. Great television. Oh yeah. Well, should we get into our top five there, Mark? Well, do I get to say anything? Oh, didn't you say? <laughs> I thought you did. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tell us, Mark, what is, what was your first takes on this episode? Well, uh, honestly, my first take would be, I loved it. it. It was a lot of information in one episode. Just to finalize and give us an ending to the season. I say season because, listeners, if you followed our Facebook post with Mark Bernardin's interview with da Damon Lindelof, you'll hear that he did not plan on another season. But HBO still can do with another producer and director if need be. So... 
this can continue on, but there's more in comic news, which is very interesting, that I like, but have you guys been reading comics? <laughs> I don't know. So, with that, I'm just going to segue and we're going to go into our top fives. So, Kyle, since you're the new guy, we're going to say you start off with your number five. <laughs> well, I kind of like from my Walking Dead, you know, days, I kind of so scanned your stuff tonight, try to over like lap stuff. But uh, but I think overall, my first five and my first thing was just like, why was Ozymandia saving his cum? <laughs> I mean, and this is coming from someone, obviously, I don't have any if there's any background to this but i was just like i i was like oh, huh <laughs> and then i mean like i guess i was like what was he doing that for but then you know we do get to see that it led to the birth of lady true and then you know it's like obviously you know his mom had some beef with him but then you know that turning into i guess lady true you know obviously turning into a worthy adversary for him like that part was all fantastic, so it just kind of it was a really weird thing to see. <laughs> yeah. And there were a lot of vials. Like this wasn't like this wasn't just like you know like you know like somebody you you hear about couples and stuff who they'll they'll you know s harvest and save <laughs> their eggs or their sperm for you know for the a future time or or whatever. <clears throat> that was that was a big cabinet. There was a lot in there. I was. Just, I'm with you, Kyle. I was like, what? What's the purpose of that? Like, unless you're doing something and you're seeding, you know, right? You're sp spreading that seed <laughs> somehow. I, I don't know. I don't even want to yeah. go down this path. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> All right. Steve, what was your number five? So my number five was just really quick, and it was just the fact I and I laughed every time I watched it. I have no problem with people throwing up on screen. That's not a that's I don't have that phobia, whatever it is that about vomiting. But just the fact that they talked about how the trans the teleportation would make people nauseous, yeah. uh, nauseous. But Wade was the only one, <laughs> and it was like literally every time they teleported, Wade's like, <laughs> you know, every <laughs> every time, and everybody else is just kind of fine. And I just I was like. It, I laughed every time when I saw that because I was just like, poor Wade, the guy's, you know, it's like sad sack, He's, you know, picking on me. <laughs> well, well, my number five would be seeing everything that we did not before, which would be Lady True coming to Adrian Veidt in the Arctic. Lady True's mother running away with the semen of Adrian Veidt, showing Lady True how she was created and how we saw the squids and breaking him down you know all the you know a lot of this is like me just watching the show and everything but saying that he created a rerun at the end i don't get it it's like honestly it is a rerun he's bringing the squids down <laughs> again yeah, as I rewatched that and as I heard her say that, I realized that what she was doing in a backhanded way was insulting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because basically cuz remember in the last episode, we talked they talked a lot about the fact that Dr. Manhattan, he kept telling Dr. Manhattan you don't have any imagination. And so for Adrian, this was a big deal when she comes to visit him and he's like, "Oh yeah, it's on our, I I wrote a, a random algorithm so that I don't even know where they're going to appear over the globe." And he was so like he he was was almost talking about it like he wanted her to be impressed by it and she's just like, mm. "Yeah, I know." <laughs> and so uh so I I think that's what what it was really coming from was this idea of she shows up there in 2008 and she tells him everything. She's just like you know, I know what you did. I know how you did it. I know that you didn't get any recognition for it. And I want to say thank you. So she kind of starts out by buttering him mm -hmm. up. 
Mm-hmm. And then she goes into this backhanded insult of now you're just now you're just rerunning what you've already done. You're not doing anything new. And she's like, we need to get Dr. Manhattan so we can get rid of all the nukes. And you start to see that that narcissism that that uh, I don't want to really call it insanity, but there's definitely a bit of. Yeah, narcissism and yeah, like she, she's, she's mostly narcissism, I'd say. Yeah, and, yeah, and just some ego yeah, about ego. That she knows. How, yeah, she knows what the answer is, and and she's gonna solve everybody's. Problem. Oh yeah, and yeah. that that was the whole thing that took me aback because she's pretty much a depiction of her own father. If you think about it, Adrian mm-hmm. Veidt is her father. Am I wrong in saying yeah. that? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no, no, no. She, she knew. She knew. And obviously, her mother had told her from the beginning where she came from and how she came about. And you can tell also that she, she realized when she says to him that you didn't. My mother was one of your cleaning ladies, and you didn't even notice when she left. You know, you didn't even notice when she was gone. Yeah. And yet she stole this sample from you. And obviously it's one of those things that I think is, again, it's kind of a backhanded insult to him to realize that you never even knew this sample was taken. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, mm-hmm. you don't, you didn't even realize it. So, yeah. Um, and that was not to, not to jump ahead, but that was my number four really was that her visit to him there at Karnak was, was uh, lady true showing up there and, it's interesting because when you think about what happened last episode, yeah. there are things that when Cal showed up in 2009 that he already knew, like she had already told him that Dr. Manhattan was not on Jupiter. He was. And so now we know how he knew. Mm-hmm. This is so confusing. <laughs> now we know how he knew that Dr. Manhattan wasn't on Mars and some of the things. So he, it wasn't, there wasn't a problem for him when he asked to be sent there yeah so that would lead us to kyle's number four (laughs) yes well uh basically gene smart who plays agent blake like i think she is probably my favorite character in this whole show like (laughs) yeah i mean again like the acting in this like was so so above like that at least i can you know think of right now you know like oh another show that just ended or it's i don't know that's like her witty responses is just her dialogue just watching what you know just watching her do her thing like it was it just made the show so much more fun to watch and also kind of gave it that little i don't know like a just a not taking myself serious kind of thing because of everything that's going on <laughs> and then you're seeing it just it helped just like oh yeah i'm just gonna go with this i don't care if there's squids falling down from the s- sky and i have no idea what that means <laughs> you know or like you know dr manhattan and his semen and you know it's like whatever it's just it is it's fun but uh you know overall it's like i have to give props to all the actors in the show because i think they helped sell so much of it especially to someone that has no that's not already like a you know a comic fan that already kind of went into it with like already knowing things or expecting things and it just this this universe and what they showed was literally like probably one of the most entertaining things i've seen in a long time (laughs) yeah and her her interaction with with tim blake nelson as as uh as looking Uh glass was just priceless throughout when when he when he's behind her in in the when she's uh uh, being tied to that chair Uh, yes uh, she's like mirror guy (laughs) and he's like you know it's looking glass you know (laughs) and it's it's like and then and then at the end when he hits adrian with the with the wrench and he's like that guy talks too much (laughs) you know and she's like he's fucking right he does i just it was just just their back and forth and and their interaction was uh, was great and i love i love seeing for me i love seeing those two characters at the end together Mm -hmm. Because it reminded me a lot of, and, and again, this goes back to the movie and to the the comic book, was the Dan Dryberg and this same character, Lori Blake, being the last two at the end of the comic book as well. So, yeah. yeah, Very cool. I had an additional thing with my number four that uh, I wanted to bring up that I thought was, was really cool, was going back to that 
uh, that opening scene that we have where she comes and visits him. But during that thing, we, we get we get the understanding of all of these things that he knew beforehand. And there's a bit of a, you know, there's a callback to almost every prison break uh, movie or TV show or like Shawshank Redemption where he, he uh, tunnels his way out with the horseshoe. And we see him, you know, when, when the, when the rocket ship lands there on, in, on Europa, he sees it out the window and we see him crawl through whatever tunnel he's created. And he comes up from under the, under the earth. But I, what I didn't realize until the second or uh, third time that I watched it was he comes up from that tunnel in the earth and all the clones are right there. Like they've known all along exactly what oh, he's yeah. been doing. <laughs> yeah. You know, like they're right there. Like he comes out of the ground and they're already there waiting for him. Yeah, exactly. And even the warden is already there waiting for him. Like, yeah, we know what you've been doing this entire, how, for however many years it took you to, to dig this tunnel, you know? <laughs> and I just, I just laughed at that. And, uh, you know, some other, uh, great callbacks that we had there was when the warden shoots him and he catches the bullet in his hand. I don't think they did that in the movie, or did they, Mark? Do you remember? I don't remember that. Did he catch the bullet in the movie? I know in the in the comic book that's a big deal about how Ozymandias is able to catch bullets in his hand. Yeah, I don't and, remember that in the movie itself. Yeah, hmm. so I, I know he does it in the comic book. So it was really cool to see that kind of callback there. Yeah. So that would lead me to my number four. Your number four, yes, sir. Uh, that would be finding out that Adrian Veidt wanted to run away from the world to be in a world of people that adored him, but that got boring to him. He knew deep down he was not a god there. He was a prisoner of his own device. And if you look at it, he played that whole thing in the very beginning, and it got boring. It got boring. I'm doing the ritual, and these people adore me, and they're doing this and this, but I want to do more. And what did he do? He wound up yeah. sending out a message to his daughter. Of all things, a daughter who he says that is not his daughter. And he wrote out daughter, which, you know, I'll, I'll that that's in my other notes, but honestly, to me, that was like so grand. The fact that he acknowledged it, it was amazing. Yeah, and and that's one of those things that we saw that in one of the previous episodes, you know, where they showed us his his message, but all we saw yeah. was "save me" and the D. We didn't see the rest of the word until this this episode. So so we all had speculation about what that D was supposed to stand for, and now of course we find his out daughter. that it's daughter and. Yeah, I just love that whole idea, that callback to, and again, it comes back to the the timing had to be precise because remember, she tells him at the beginning, she says, I found Dr. Manhattan because of whatever tachyon, whatever emissions, uh, he's on Europa and I've sent a satellite there and the satellite is going to be there in X and she almost gives like, I think she gives it like to the minute yeah, it's, it's, or something like that. How, how, yeah. when that satellite is going to be there and when it's going to beam instantaneously beam pictures back to her. So he knows, and she was expecting to see Dr. Manhattan. Of course, she sees this note from Adrian Veidt. Yeah. So, and she puts it all. Together. Yeah. That's like, I was a bit confused in that whole scene. And then obviously we, we kind of find out more information, but it was like, I didn't ever understand the whole prison thing because you know in the beginning it was just like i just thought hey he must somehow did something bad and so he got you know banished and this is kind of like his whatever you know was going on through the whole season but then in that scene you know when he's dealing with the warden it's like he's he even says he's like i've had eight years to kill and i was like <laughs> okay so you know it's like seeing what we already saw with lady true just saying hey yeah i'm like i'm looking for dr manhattan and yeah and like the sending the probe or whatever and just that whole scene it's kind of like okay well then then he must have been up there not from someone putting him there like it almost like he put himself there and then we find out later well, that he i guess you know dr manhattan asked asked him to go do that right well in the, in the last episode that's what we saw in the last episode so in the flashback with dr manhattan and because mark and i watched him multiple times there's that whole scene when before no it's it's before he he gives him the ring 
and he says the price for giving you this ring is you're going to send me to Europa. I want I want to go. I want you to send me there. Oh. So Adrian Veidt actually asked yeah. to be sent there in that episode. Okay. Um, and so so that's why he's there. And what was revealed, um, and I'll I'll give a shout out here to our, to our our fellow our friends at TV Podcast Industries. They they revealed that in interviews, Damon Lindelof has said that all of those scenes we saw in all those episodes with with uh, Adrian were a year apart. Oh. So every time you saw him cutting into the cake, that was another okay. year that he yeah. had, he had been there. So I tried to work out the math and I couldn't wrap my head around it because he goes there in 2009 and it's now 2019, the 10 years. You know, I, I couldn't work out the, where the eight years came in and, and when he was, how long was he in that prison in the, so, you know, when he, when they find him, when he makes the message, he puts the message out there in the dead body, save me daughter. And then they yank him back in and put him in that prison mm -hmm. cell. We don't yeah. know how long he was in that prison cell, oh, Yeah. you know, before the rocket landed there. So that may be the eight years that he's talking about, or I, I like I yeah, said, I tried. To it's crazy. Wrap my head no, but <laughs> but that makes more sense now. About I, I didn't even you know think to catch that. Like yeah, every time he had a birthday you know cake and like was blowing out candles mm -hmm. to actually count like oh how many candles does he have or like what you know or even that happening. <laughs> like, yeah, well, and that was the brilliance of of this one of the things of this show that I can't wait to go back and watch it again. Is if you remember, go all the way back to that first episode. When we see him and he bites into the cake and the horseshoe, or no, he he the, the uh, Mr. Phillips gives him ah. the horseshoe to cut the cake mm -hmm. with, and he says, "Oh, I don't need this yet," and he gives it back to him. Yeah, uh, um, or he keeps it. I can't remember, but but there's that whole that whole thought of there's so many things that that when we go back and watch this again, that we're going to be able to see just like the stuff like at the very beginning we find out that the Seventh Cavalry is stealing lithium or, or right. stealing batteries so they can scrape the lithium yeah. off them. And we find out in this episode, they were building that cage yeah. with it. You know, it's, it's just so it's, there's so many intricate things that, uh, that it's going to take multiple viewings to pick up on. Yep. I think <laughs> where are we at? <laughs> yeah. Are Kyle's we at Kyle's number, number three. three? Yes. Okay. Um, my three, I guess it was just the demise of the white supremacists and like the, or the, the leadership of the Cyclops. Um, I enjoyed that cause obviously they're, they're obviously like the big baddies to at least a part of everything that's going on here. But I kind of <laughs> wish that like, we got to see them suffer more. <laughs> I yeah, mean, we all did. Yeah, I mean, just having them as a plot device. And I don't know if it's obviously the comic is kind of deals with this as part of its main part. No, of, this was it... this was entirely Damon Lindelof. This well, I mean, there's some racist there, there but that's it's not really okay, so... white supremacist at all. So this was all uh, just like the fact that in the comic book, Hooded Justice, they talk about Hooded Justice that that he, he they don't know who he is in the comic book, uh -huh. but in the comic book, it still makes you think that he's a white man. Uh, in fact, I think there's like there's there's articles scattered throughout the the way the comic book is written is there's 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 the comic book panels and then there's like interspersed with written pages from people's notes and from novels and things and it was I mean they uh, Dave uh, Gibbons and Alan Moore it was a huge undertaking that that oh thing. yeah but uh, so Damon Lindelof has definitely taken some license okay. with with that in in the, specifically in the character of hood justice he's really taken some license from uh changing that character a little bit and bringing in this white supremacy uh, element so well and you know it's kind of like a uh, unfortunately a nod to current you know <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Events, themes yeah. that are going on in our own life but uh mm -hmm. yeah but yeah it's like uh i mean it you know it's kind of like when we get to this point, it's like, oh, yeah, these guys are horrible. And, like, what they're trying to do is, like, that's horrible. But, like, Lady True is like, can you make it kind of set them on fire a little bit longer <laughs> instead exactly. of vaporizing exactly. them? Because I'm like, well, it's like just like that one woman says, she's like, just go on with it. You know, it's like, well, that was kind of quick but maybe they were just running out of time and they're like oh we got to move like cut the scene <laughs> so i don't know yeah. that's that was my yeah. third 
Yeah. I had a little bit of that later, too, that I'll talk about. A little bit. But my number three is, and, and this would be one of those things that's a nod to the comic books, is when Dr. Manhattan is in that cage and he's getting confused. And he even tells Angela, oh, I'm confused about what time I'm in. And even Senator Keene kind of goes, well, where, where are you at now, Doc? And he says, oh, I'm in 1985 now and this and that. And then he says, uh, I'm not aware of anything going on in Afghanistan that needs my attention. And that's a direct quote from the comic book. And so there's another quote where he's asking Jenny, which was, would be Jenny Slater. Was that her name? The first, his first girlfriend? Um, yes. Asking her if she's cold. That's another direct quote from the comic book. So we're seeing him kind of experiencing all these times, but it's now getting jumbled because he's in this cage. So is that synthetic lithium a thing from the comic? Like, is that because I, I, I that was at least in my notes when that came up. I was like, huh? Like, what? what I'm, is I'm that? I'm trying to remember. There was something there was some substance in the comic book that he couldn't see through. Uh, and that's what, like in the last episode, he says he put that, uh, Adrian says he put the, that ring in that box and it was made of whatever. And I don't remember. It's been too long since I, I uh, went through the comic book uh, to remember exactly what. But there is a substance and it might be this this lithium that he can't see through. Um, okay. I was just yeah. curious if that was, yeah, what that was. Do you remember, Mark? There was, I know there was something in the comic book that he couldn't see past. Yeah, it was almost like a Superman thing. Right? Yeah, it Couldn't was see through it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly what the alloy was, but yeah. So you're number three, Mark. My number three would be finding out that Adrian Fight was always there the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, he's been there the whole time. Uh, obviously, you already pointed that out. It's like this is a year previous. So Lady True had him embossed in gold. And didn't thaw him out until the end, but only to help in what was needed in the end, what was happening. Even though he was still a person that was involved from the initial squid attack, but to help out to resolve the situation in the end. <laughs> With yet again, another one yeah. that will destroy everyone that was involved with capturing Dr. Manhattan. And he created his own squid attack yeah. again, which made sense. Yeah, and and that's that's great that you bring that up because I hadn't even thought. It, it, again, that's another one of those things that you know we we saw the camera angles and things throughout the season mm -hmm. where they would pull back and we they would pull back from one of something happening with him and they would pull out of that statue, you know. And we just thought it was just a statue that she had. But remember uh, in whatever episode it is, three or two or three, when uh, when uh, Lori goes and she and she sees the statue and she's like, well, why did you make it so old? And obviously now we know it, it was old because it was actually him. Yeah, you know? <laughs> exactly. So. It's so wild how they created all this and were able to. I I think that. The actor only worked on it for like about what two weeks. I I know they said that all of those um all of those scenes with him in Europa were all shot in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, now I don't know about this last episode when when it came into play, but they said all those episodes that took place in Europa were like in Wales or Scotland or somewhere like that, and they were all filmed over like a two week period. And they had to mesh them into the actual story. And he was still building the story at that time, too. Which makes my mind blown. Because they actually had to create the idea of Adrian Veidt. And then figure out what are they going to do with this character. And implement him in this story structure between Angela, Will, Cal, and... Uh, I'm forgetting... Lori. Lori, yeah. Yeah. Lori yeah. Blake. Yeah. Weaving them all together. Right. Yeah, and weaving them all together to get this whole story. And that's a lot of work. <laughs> well, we can see why. I think, uh, again, another podcast mentioned the fact that I think they took two years. It spent They spent, uh, Damon Lindelof and the writers spent like two years writing, just writing this uh, this season. And that's that's why they commented that, that probably why Damon Lindelof 
uh, really is saying there's not going to be a season two or he's not going to be involved in a season two because even if they started today, yeah. <laughs> it would be, you're talking, you know, 2022 before they even have it done written. And then they got to, then they've got to film it and then they've got to edit it. And so you're looking at like 2023, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and, and that's, that's even guessing that they have an idea. They've got to yeah. get an idea first of what they're going to do. Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like they have so many things that they can pull from if they wanted to. It's like, oh that's, yeah, that's, that's the thing that made me think about like, okay, this cannot be the end because there's so many. Even like on reading other blogs and stuff like that, there's just like everybody's like, oh well, but they could go with the uh, the slender. What was who was the guy? I forgot his name. The one that the vigilante that oh, got away. The new Lube Man. Yeah, Lube Man. Yeah, yeah, it's like they're talking. It's like that can be a whole completely just you know season yes. of its own if they wanted to they could go back and do a whole whole season on Lori before she joined the FBI yeah, yeah. Be, you know when she was still a masked uh, a masked vigilante and then and they could do the story of how she became the and I've got it in my notes the quote where she says where they're talking about her being in the FBI and she's like, I'm their best vigilante hunter yeah you know we we can they could do, they could do a whole episode a whole episode a whole series uh, on just, that uh, yeah. that story yeah. alone, yeah, yeah, we don't know anything about Dan Dryberg. We know that he was Dan Dryberg was Night Owl, and he from what uh, from the Pedipedia files on HBO, uh, he's in prison. So there's a story there. There's there's lots of things they could do with this universe mm -hmm. that I just hope they do it justice as they do. Yeah, do oh, it. that's always the concern. And especially, what, didn't they actually use her real name? In the actual episode? Yes, I think, who is it? Adrian calls her uh, Japusnik, which was her original name before she changed it to Blake, before she remembered that, uh, that yes. before before she found out that the comedian was her father, she went by, J I think it's Japusnik, Japosnik or something yeah. something like that. Uh, Jupeslik, where, uh, I, I, uh, Kevin Smith and Mark Menard yeah. know better than it's, I do. It's so. in the... My my suggestion watch uh watch Fat Man Beyond it's, on uh, YouTube. It, it's in it's in the comic book because that's the name that she goes by in the comic book. Yeah. she didn't take up Blake until this this uh, series came out. So, exactly. So, that will lead us to Kyle's number two. Uh, well, I mean, just kind of more of just the overall like style of the show. It's just like I I loved all the Lady Trues like like I I said inventions, but just like. All the stuff that was, you know, surrounded by her, like the millennial cock, it was like just the way it looked. And then yeah. not knowing what it really was going to do, it was like, and I guess everybody didn't know. Um, but it's just the style of it. And it's like, you know, the flying reactor, that was just so cool. And then the spaceship <laughs> that came and got Osviandas, like that thing was so cool looking. Um, and then even her house, you know, it's just, it's, it's like she's living in like in a, a biodome. <laughs> like on... Yeah, she brought Vietnam with her. Yeah, <laughs> it was just fun because it was like very futuristic and modern. Then you know, and then the outside of everybody's just kind of in their normal day to day. You know, you're just you know nothing special. You know, like settings, and so it was cool. And that yeah. crazy hat she was wearing. I don't know what was going mm -hmm. on with that. So yeah, <laughs> so read your mind. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, my number two uh, kind of goes along with uh, what uh, Kyle's number three was, but I'll add a little bit on there is that it, Senator Keen, you know, he, he definitely should have deserved worse than what he got, but it, it was important because his blood, you know, she opens those doors and his blood just flows across the floor and that gives Dr. Manhattan enough of a a jolt or a push or whatever that he's able to transport adrian laurie and looking glass to antarctica back to karnak so that they can in, eventually save the day and that just goes back to that way that he sees time that he knows you know he knows what's going to happen and he knew what he was supposed to do so he, he touches that blood and then sends them uh, teleports them away. Yeah, I thought I thought oh, yeah. it was interesting when that happened because it like you you see it go underneath the cage. Like you know, there's like the gap of the cage. And I was kind of like, well, wait, 
I've kind of, th- I, I just kind of figured this, like this thing would be like airtight or like, you know, like mm-hmm. sealed, but then, yeah, it, it, that was able to go through. And then obviously he uses that almost like a conduit to like send his power through because he's in there. And that was like kind of the one way that he can get to the outside of the cage. Um, yeah. And yeah, using his yeah. blood, it was like, it's kind of gross, but Hey, it worked. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I like that conduit. Yeah, that's exactly that's, what it yeah, was. Yeah, that's kind of how I took it. It was just like, hey, there's the opening that his like electricity. It'll f- you know flow through water, you know, water or whatever. So he was able to kind of mm-hmm. be able to reach outside of the cage. That would bring me to my number two, which would be all the callbacks that would happen to you know Doctor Manhattan in this episode. Apparently, that was what Lady True wanted to do with Doctor Manhattan: grind him down to a mush. <laughs> and and drink him in and take his power and be, i guess she wanted to really be blue <laughs> uh, i don't know but uh, and have all that power and to be what would be ultimately be a god but that did not happen so uh, i'm happy about that <laughs> yeah i still didn't understand her plan or how like like i i it, some of it just didn't make sense to me. I didn't understand what Senator Keen, how he was going to suck his power out. Because, like, she she made the point that when Senator Keen drew Dr. Manhattan's power out and tried to put it into himself, it exploded him. It popped him like a water balloon, is what she says. Uh-huh. And uh, then it went back, and that's that scene where we see Dr. Manhattan start to dematerialize, and then he comes back. And that was after Senator Keen when they push that button and they teleports them to where the millennium clock is. Yeah. And that's where she's got that filter. Cause then she says, Oh, you couldn't have expected to take all those tachyons in without having some sort of a filter. And so I'm guessing that's what the clock was supposed to do was filter Dr. Manhattan's power so that it could go into her. But then of course with the squid attack, it, it, that failed. It was, yeah, it was exactly. Apart. The, the clock was a key to Dr. Manhattan, and that's mm-hmm. what was going on. So apparently nobody figured out that key. Yeah. Even Lady True. And apparently Dr. Manhattan understood that. So that's where we're at at the end, which would lead us to our number one with Kyle. Uh, Well, it's basically just like how, like everything about how the finale played out. It's like... Like from what we saw throughout the season leading up to this, it, this was like basically the big reveal, and it and you know to me it answered so many of all the questions and just kind of tied everything up. Like you know, just I know earlier in the season I kind of was just like not knowing what's going on, you know, and even with some of the like glimpses of uh, Doctor Manhattan, um, like or uh, Angela taking the. Uh, nostalgia pills you know it's like that kind of Mm -hmm. filled in some stuff but you still i didn't know what the bigger picture was it was just kind of like oh i felt like there was so much kind of going on you know even like the like when she was being uh uh d uh drug or whatever when lady true had her hooked up to the elephant i was like yeah, the dialysis. Yeah, but I was like, even thing. then, I'm like, I okay, I have no idea what that <laughs> is doing. It's like <laughs> that poor elephant. Like, what's going on? And, um, but it's just like now we get to this point, and you know, the whole bigger picture basically is just shown to us, and this the way they did it really was just awesome. Like it, it just made this like show, uh, like just how creative and impactful it was, and just with. Yeah, we can rewatch this probably like so many times and still find new things out of you know like out of it or just oh, like, yeah. little subtle hints Absolutely. and stuff like that. Yeah. And to me, it's like there's been so many shows that I've watched and I'm like, oh, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm not gonna go back and rewatch it. You know, it's like you see it once and you're done. Um, I like the idea of like you know being able to go back to this and still be surprised, still be like, oh, that's really interesting. I totally missed that. Um, so yeah. I just the way. I yeah, just the way this all played out to us getting to the end of it, and then you know, seeing Angela at the end, like I just thought it was a very very well done like 
finale compared to f- some finales we know from the shows we do not say <laughs> the names of. <laughs> I was about to speak it too, and I guess I won't. Now. Um, uh, are you talking about another show that Damon Lindelof was involved in with J.J. Abrams? Oh no, 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 no! I'm talking about a show, oh. a show that I uh, <laughs> I cover oh, oh, on the oh, podcast. Yeah, no, oh yeah, no, that was not done. No, I was thinking, I was thinking you were talking about Lost because one of the things that people really said about Lost was they didn't like the ending they didn't like how it how it wrapped up and it kind of left too much too much hanging and i think you definitely can see that damon lindelof has learned from that experience he's he's learned kind of how to bring a uh a show together and and yeah. have this kind of a, a really positive ending and or at least leave enough open things open that uh yeah. Well, just leave enough of things open that that we can make our own decisions. About well, and yeah, and I, I have to agree because it's like knowing that this prop- possibly is basically it, and it was just as a one off. But it was like getting that point and just ending with her mm-hmm. in front of the pool like that. Like th- that's a cliffhanger that is also like still an ending. <laughs> you know, like it, it's not like it, it's. It's done. It's done well that I'm like I'm not gonna have any problems if like, like this is it. It's like that was just so entertaining, well done, and it, yes, and it lets you kind of create it yourself, and like you can just run with it instead of like being like, oh no, we need like it has to be answered or like I can't enjoy the rest of the show. It was like it's that was just a fun way to end it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Very good. Uh, so my number one, I, I want to kind of piggyback off on what everybody else is saying because there's there is a lot to say. But one of the things I noticed in my last watch of it was in that instant before Dr. Manhattan dies, um, when he becomes Cal again, he he flashes all these memories and Angela asks him, where are you? And he says, I'm at every moment that I spent with you. And that was so touching uh, to me because some of those memories that we see are the memories of those 10 years. Mm -hmm that they had together. So it almost, for me, the last time I I watched it, it almost seemed like he got back those, those 10 years and that, that he, he was able to, he, he was able to experience those 10 years as Dr. Manhattan and as Cal. And I, I really, I thought that was a really cool moment to see because he he didn't have that. Remember in the in the last episode, when he was talking to he was talking about those ten years, he said he had a gap. He said I, I, I there's a there's a or when he was talking to before those ten years started, but he knew the, the after, and uh, he, you know it's so weird his experiences of time is that in when we see him in two thousand nine, he's talking about that he has this gap. Because he he knows what's happening in 2019, but he doesn't know what happens before. Now when he's in this cage and he's right at the end of his life, he's getting that those 10 years back. And it's that whole life, uh, your life flashing before your eyes. And for him, the most important thing of his life was her. Yeah. And I just I, I was I just really felt touched by that. And just like last week when we talked about the who he loved. And the fact that I don't know if he ever really loved Lori when they were in a, a relationship together. I don't know if he really actually ever loved the first Silk Spectre that, or uh, yeah, the one that he was the, before Lori. I think Angela was was his one and he knew that. So that uh, that just really touched me. And uh, and then, of course, I, we haven't brought it up yet, but that that where we've kind of talked a little bit about it, that whole ending of her eating the egg. And then, you know, is she going to become Dr. Manhattan? Is she going to walk on water? Is she just going to fall in the pool? And we get to make our own decision on that. Yeah. I, I, I love that ending. I know I've seen some things online that people are disappointed by the ending, that they weren't given a, a right. you know, a firm Send ending. Send off, yeah. Yeah, but I liked it. I, I think it's, I, I like, I sometimes, I, I will admit sometimes I don't like it. In this particular episode, I, I or this aspect, I really liked that they kind of leave it open for us. Yeah. yeah, I love that, and that will lead me to my number one, which would be that ending. Leaving it open-ended for our thoughts, mm-hmm. maybe a conclusion to the season that may or may not happen, but 
Dr. Manhattan actually got to live a life that he did not know of at that point with Angela and didn't see that all at once. So Dr. Manhattan giving himself in an egg for Angela to consume and be what he was. That would be amazing. To walk on water and do what he did. I'm curious. This show was amazing. Honestly, uh, the whole season. It took off from a comic book that was, what, 35 years ago? Uh, yeah, 80, 88. I know it portrays 1985, but I think the comic book was 88. Yeah. Uh, within that realm yeah. with uh, over 30 years yeah so you know the fact that you know thank you damon lindelof for doing that you know that was amazing <laughs> that was incredible you created a show after a comic that had ended over 30 years ago and gave us more questions <laughs> based upon this with your own show and can be concluded, but will it be concluded is another question. <laughs> so HBO, I think, is wanting to do this, but will they do that? I don't know. I, I really would like to see where it you know, tips off after this, because honestly, I would like to see another show based upon this, where they go from here, because... What happens to Looking Glass? What happens to Panda? We never saw what, who, or what Panda was. I have a lot of questions about the other characters that were in masks that we saw in this show. HBO has a way of doing that, and I don't think <laughs> Alan Moore is going to be happy with it. <laughs> but honestly, as a viewer... And somebody who had actually read the actual comic book when it came out and read the trade again. I'm curious, where is it going to go? This is amazing. You know, they, they created another world. And we'll go into that other world in our comic news, too, because... Well, and, you know, the, the thing is, is about this is you have to remember the original comic book was 30 years ago. Yeah. The Zack Snyder movie was, what, 15 years ago? 10 years, 10, 11, whenever, whenever yeah. the Zack Snyder movie was. And so, unfortunately, I don't mind. If it's, if it's another 10 years before they do something with Watchmen. Yeah, I, take I, the time. If they're going to do it, this was so good. If they're going to do it, they right. need yeah. to do it right. Don't, don't do it haphazard. Don't just throw it together. I, I want them to do what... Damon Lindelof, I, I want, I would love for somebody to, to come up with some original thing, you know, eight years from now and, or whenever and do it. Everything do it is then. now. Don't, yeah. uh, unfortunately we are in a world where they want to strike while the iron is hot. They want to make money. And, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if they try to throw together a season two, like in yeah. a year. And or a year and a half, and try to to show us something, and it's it. Uh, oh yeah, I just hope whatever they do doesn't take away from yeah. and this. It makes you appreciate it more though, knowing that it did take them like two years just to write the thing. You know, like if it like mm -hmm. that's and exactly. it, and you can see where it pays off. It's like okay, it was absolutely amazing. Um, but yeah, it's like if they're going to try to go into the aspect of like, because we're in that world where now everybody's like a streaming service and they all have to want to have their own little IPs that draw you in there that, you know, that doesn't always work unless you're going to put the money behind it and like, yeah, the time. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see if they do dollars. Yeah, talk, <laughs> <laughs> and I have a feeling the ratings exactly. on this and this, the you know the the you know the how they track you know social media and all that stuff. It's like this this has to have raised an eyebrow, being like, I think we just nailed yeah. something out of the park. Well, I already said my quote, so uh, why don't you guys share your quotes? Uh, Kyle, you go first. <laughs> it was just Agent Blake. She's like, to uh, uh, what's his face, Senator uh, Keen. Yeah, Senator King is like, you look stupid in those pants. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that And hilarious? it was again, it was again, it's like, here's this moment where she, he's like spouting off this crap. Just like, I right, look how awesome I'm going to be blue and blah, blah, blah. And then she just comes off with that. 
Total quote. It was just, it was hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, you know, it's one thing if he'd just been wearing like boxers or, or shoes, no, it was like, it's specifically the same kind of panties that, that Dr. Manhattan would wear in the comic book whenever he wanted to cover himself up. But I'm just like, what, dude, what, where did you get those first? And <laughs> right. Why? And who made them? Like, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <sighs> Well, my one quote would be Lady True saying, Hi, I'm Sample 2346. I'm Cole True. She was so stoic and very confrontational to her father, quote unquote. You know, yeah, this is Adrian Veidt. The fact that he stated, I will never call you daughter, rings through her head as she states that. And you could see it. You know, especially within the acting. Yeah, and well, then, and then there when she when when he when he gets off the rocket and he's wearing his Ozymandias costume and she like tries to give him some different clothes and he's like, no, I want to wear these and she's like, no, this is more appropriate for someone your for age. Your age. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? yeah. And uh, and then she just throws it. I love how she threw it in his face. The whole thing of you said you'd never call me daughter, but yet you wrote this message, yeah. this huge message that had to take hundreds of bodies. And, you know, however many hours or however long it took him and how many bodies it took to spell that out. And she just goes, Dad. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. All right. uh, we have some other notes. So, uh, Kyle, do you want to go forth? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just make another little kind of add on to just that whole Lady True. Because I, I noticed it like on one of my other rewatches, like at the end. When uh, Doctor Manhattan teleports them to um, you know, Antarctica and like fight, like he he's gone, and then Lady True like goes up to Doctor Manhattan, is just like, "Where are they?" You know, and like gets all you know pissed off or whatever. But it's kind of funny if you like watch her, like when she, I think she was talking to her mom or whatever, trying to like I, whatever that scene was of, I guess trying to get things going or whatever. Like the way she portrayed it, like. She, she, she's almost like she's like a little kid just like having a tantrum just being all like no 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 no. i wanted to throw that in his face and then like she can't do it and then i don't know it's kind of like the subtle like how she acted that it, i almost felt it was like oh she's like getting ready to throw a little hissy fit because she can't <laughs> throw this in his face that you know he's gonna she's gonna take uh his powers away and i don't know it was just <laughs> her character just the way she played it again it was yeah. awesome um uh, I already talked about the synthetic lithium, but, um, again, like, I don't know if it means anything or not, but I'm like, I always, especially like in, you know, the show that I've, you know, covered and like walking dead, there's sometimes there's always like little things that happen or like you see. And I always wonder, it's like, Oh, is there something about that? Um, kind of like, you know, like, like when the director's name comes up of who have directed the episode, usually that scene's supposed to mean something to the yeah. director of that episode. Um, that like when the squids were falling and Angela was running to the theater, like originally you see everybody passing that when they're driving up or it says dreamland. And of course it's talking about, uh, right. Oklahoma's mm -hmm. final pre performances. But when the squids come, they're like knocking the lights out. And so it just left with the DR and then ML and the D. And I was just wondering, was that some, well, and, do and you I guys the, recognize that? Well, I see the screen. <laughs> I see the screen grab that you got. And I think if you, if you, if you go past that that moment, the L actually drops out, and you get the D, the R, and the M lit up, and then there's and the D goes out, and you can see what I saw this last, and I didn't catch it. I, I tried to pause it, but I couldn't catch it. Is that the D, the R, and the M are lit up, and there's an E, an N, and a D that are kind of just um, not not uh, bright, but are just outlined enough that you can read Ian. So it's almost like Dr. M end. So, okay. so yeah, I, and I, I try to get this at the very moment I could. So I, th I think that was the message that they were trying to, that that visual cue is trying to put out is either that Dr. M isn't ended or that Dr. M actually is ended. Like, I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's meant to leave us. It's kind of like with Angela, her foot touching the water and we don't know if she's going to walk right. or not. It's that same kind of thing because, um, again, and this is a, a moment from the comic book, is when Dr. Manhattan is pulled apart by Adrian Veidt, he puts himself back together very quickly. And he says, that's the first thing I learned 
was how to put myself back together after I was pulled apart. So there's almost a, a, a thought or a, a maybe Dr. Manhattan is still alive. Maybe they didn't kill him, you know, uh, kind of thing. I think that's what was meant by that that uh, final cue was to give you okay. that, that. I knew I knew it had to probably mean something positive. Yeah, <laughs> it was I, kind I, of very specific thing to see. So. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that's what was what we were meant to have that question of you know the the whether he is or isn't kind of thing. Steve, do you you had more right? Yeah, I just had a couple real quick ones. I just the last time I watched it, I thought, man, all those clones are left alone again. You yeah. know, <laughs> and uh, uh, those those poor clones. Now they don't even have the game warden uh, leading them around uh, anymore as well. And, I, you know, it was cool to see Robert Redford's picture on the newspaper, but I really wish they could have. And I know he's probably retired from acting, or but it would I think it would have been cool to at least get some sort of cameo from Robert Redford in this uh, in this show. I think that would have been uh, really fun, especially with the line that Adrian says, you know, as if a cowboy could actually. Uh, become president on his own, uh, knowing that Ronald Reagan was president in the '80s and that kind of stuff. So I, I, uh, I really wish we could have got Robert Redford to do something. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Uh, what about you, Mark? Well, honestly, the only thing I could really give would be finding out that Looking Glass was still alive and ready to fight was a nice touch in the whole episode. I miss that character. You know, that character was very prominent within the first few episodes of the season, if you would call it a season. But I really enjoyed the character, and I wanted to see more. I'm hoping they, you know, if they do continue this series, they actually continue it with this particular character. Because I think there's a lot more in there that uh, they could create a show about. And the last part would be the senator, which would be, what, was Senator Keenan? Keen, right. And, yeah, you know, that that was interesting, but he knew he was doomed once I saw those trunks on him. I, honestly, I, it's like, <laughs> I, you, you brought it up, and honestly, that's all I got. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's great. It's it was a good scene to to see him lay the whole plan out. I think that w one of the things that's good about about hearing that was, you know, we had questions about whether Judd Crawford actually was a racist or not, whether whether he was in on the plan, and we get to find out that yes, he was in on the plan. That the whole idea was he and his wife, after the White Knight, were going to come in and befriend the family of the survivor when they found out, you know, that that's one of those questions we had. We, we had what happened to the other seven, the cavalry member that was in Angela's house. Well, when, now we know that Cal, when his life was threatened, when his wife was threatened, he zapped the guy away. To, and so that's how, that's how the seventh cavalry figured out that Dr. Manhattan was on earth and he was pretending to be a human. And that's how they started this whole thing. And so he gets, they get Judd Crawford and Jane Crawford to befriend the family that that Dr. Manhattan is hiding with. And that's really sets this whole thing in motion. Yeah. Uh, we can move on to comic talk. Yeah. So comic talk this week. Well, I have a few. So as the doomsday clock finale confirms the lack of golden age heroes never inspired a young Clark Kent to become Superboy before he was Superman. <laughs> And without Superboy to inspire the future's generation of superheroes, there was nothing to spark the formation of the Legion of Superheroes, either. So, however, Manhattan addresses all those problems in this issue by rewriting the interference with DC history and causing ripple effects throughout the modern DC universe. And that is a quote based upon what's going on in Doomsday Clock. And Doomsday Clock is basically after what had happened during Watchmen. And if a lot of you listeners are hearing this, basically, I think Steve and I have been broaching this over the past year about Doomsday Clock. I know you've mentioned it a couple times, but I, I haven't. I, I've been so bad at following comics and especially DC comics that I had no clue. I've seen it on the shelf uh, in my comic book shop, but I've never picked one up. Yeah. So basically, uh, 
Dr. Manhattan is basically putting a close to what's going on within the Doomsday Clock. Uh, I did not pick up the most recent issue, but this was a quote based upon what's going on. I had to travel the verse of Mark Bernardin. If you actually listen or watch Fat Man Beyond with Kevin Smith and Mark Bernardin, Mark Bernardin likes to actually copy and paste, and that's what I did. So I did what Mark Bernardin does, copy and paste all the information. So if you didn't read the comic, go out there, read it. Do not listen to this, please. <laughs> <laughs> or listen to it and read it because <laughs> I, that's what I'm going to have to do because I didn't pick up my comics this week because it's holiday week and it's holiday weeks <laughs> for me. And I do retail <laughs> services, and I don't have a time to actually get out to get my comics. So I'm going to just, you know, enjoy the comic as it is and see what happens with this story when it unfolds. So honestly, from my understanding, it seems like Dr. Manhattan is ending everything within this Doomsday Clock series. And... Apparently, that's what had happened during this episode of Watchmen. If you think about it, he created and changed everything. So, with Angela and continuing on, maybe that happens in the comic. I don't know. I didn't read the comic. So, go out there and buy your comics. And if you read it, prove me wrong. Send a bad comment. Please, tell me I'm bad, Mark. I love it. I love the idea. So at least, you know, I'm being honest saying I didn't pick up my comics. I didn't. I didn't. Sorry. So that's all I have for really pretty much of actual comic books. But there is a Birds of Prey movie that got a rated R rating for the theaters. So what do you guys think about this Birds of Prey movie that's got a rated R this is the Brady. this is the Harley Quinn one, right? The Harley Quinn female yes. bad guy yes. team up kind of movie. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it comes out in February, and so I'm, I'm you know tentatively excited. We'll see. I don't know. I wasn't super impressed with Suicide Squad. I mean, I liked Margot Robbie. I liked her portrayal there of Harley Quinn, and I know it it launched kind of that character again. So I guess we'll, yeah. we'll see what this is gonna uh, bring us in February. Yeah, she's a pretty lady, and honestly, that's probably a lot of what the draw is to a lot of heterosexual males that are out there. I want to see Harley Quinn kicking ass. I don't know about the LBGTQ plus community out there, but my feeling is, is that I think they would be more embraced in seeing a female provoked character. I like the idea. I like the idea of... It not being a heroine, but like a dark heroine. And I like the idea that she is going to do something. But the idea that the Birds of Prey itself, the characters that are in it, are not being prevalent. It's just Harley Quinn. So, I don't know. I, I might be judgmental forthright at this point. But I'll watch it and I'll see it and I'll take it for what it is. But, uh, Kyle, what do you think about the actual trailer itself? Uh, I mean, I, I've only gotten to like, see it, the, the ones, but I think just overall, I mean, Harley Quinn was always my fa one, one of my favorite like characters in the Batman series from like the cartoon like way back when. Uh, <laughs> and, like, I actually have the uh, cookie jar with uh, Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy on a, a motorcycle. <laughs> it's like one of my favorite things. But I, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm all about the whole Gotham universe. <laughs> so I'm like, so I'll, I'll give it. I, I didn't really uh, like uh, uh, what I, the, the other show. Batman uh, versus Superman or? No, the one you just mentioned, uh, which obviously I didn't see. Oh, Suicide Squad. Su yeah, Suicide Squad, yeah. yeah. I saw parts like I, when it came, you know, out or whatever. I kind of was like, eh, I don't know. And then, of course, I think people were already kind of giving it not so great reviews. But just what, like, I caught a little bit of it, like just when it was on TV. And I, you know, I don't know. It's just backlash. It, no, it's entertaining, but it's just like, but if they don't do it right, it could just kind of then go 
Right. And that's, and I kind of felt that way with Suicide Squad, even though I didn't really watch the whole entire thing, but it was just like, I don't know. There was just something about it that just didn't quite click. And then I was like, eh, no, it's, it, I don't know. So I, I'll give it a shot. I, I might not go see it in the theater just because I, I usually wait till <laughs> things come out on streaming or on HBO. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do the same thing as well. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, the one thing that I think we all are interested in, because it's the topic of the week, and by the time that you listen to this, it will be Sunday, and everybody has seen it. That would be Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. Yes, Star Wars was a movie, but yet we talk about this since it is pop culture, and has a comic to it as well. So that's why we are bringing this up. So... We'll talk about this in reviews of Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. Do you guys have any thoughts on the idea of the movie? I know I have not seen it because everybody else is probably going out there right now <laughs> in the middle of the night going to go see this as we are podcasting. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I Star Wars to me is like obviously the original three are all to me it's just like that are really all that matter <laughs> yeah uh but i mean the i i still love the universe and it's still it's still entertaining and i enjoy it i i i not gonna obviously i'm not gonna go see it when the theater is full of people because i just i don't like watching movies when there's like 50,000 people around you. I want to be a little bit like I'll go to a matinee when everybody's already seen it after it's been weeks. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it looks, it looks good. I, I mean, I've already, you know, the, at least on the reviews or just, you know, on even local television when they're reviewing, it, it's like they said, it's like, a, it's got a lot kind of a nostalgia element. So it kind of harkens back to obviously like, you know, every, all the original show or movies. So I'm like, if it's a feel good and it, kind of has that play I, i'm i'm sure i'll enjoy it like i'm not i'm just not really looking into trying to like dive deep more than and just like you know well i'm i'm super excited for the conclusion of the the skywalker series uh, series the story because i mean i i was uh, my parents didn't let me go see the first one in the in the theaters but i did set set outside to see empire and i i sat in line for I think two or three hours uh, to see Jedi uh, when I was a kid. And uh, I, I, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm super stoked. I've got a ticket for tomorrow for a matinee tomorrow. And I think I even got a ticket for a Saturday <laughs> matinee as well. Cause I'm, I'm going to want to see it twice. And uh, I'm uh, like I said, I, I grew up with this uh, when, when they re-released them in the theater, I went and finally saw the first one at a theater on the big, in the big screen and uh, really, really just loved it. Loved seeing that uh, even with all the changes that they make to it and those kind of things. I, it doesn't bother me. I, I love it though. I am. Um, I'm super excited. I'm cautiously optimistic. It's going to be sad knowing that, uh, you know, Carrie Fisher's not around and, seeing what they do with that character. Um, I want to see how they, I want to see how they, they end this up. I have avoided spoilers completely, except for the, the, the previews and the trailers. I have avoided uh, seeing any kind of like spoilers of what the plot is or what the outcome is or anything like that. I don't, I don't want to know any of that. I want to go in completely fresh and, and just watch it and, uh, uh, and be excited for it. Yeah. And my take on it is I've been seeing Star Wars since 1977. I was five years old. My godmother, Lena Lee Buttermark, and my uncle, Kenny Buttermark, actually took me out to go see that movie. And it was just called The Star Wars. It wasn't even called Star Wars A New Hope. They didn't change that title until about a year later. And... I've been a Star Wars fan since, you know. I got the early bird special because my aunt, my godmother, Lena, wound up buying me that. And I had gotten those figures, you know, months later. <laughs> and I loved it. And I loved the whole idea of the Star Wars thing. I saw the prequels in the theaters just like everybody else. I actually saw the special editions like everybody else in the mm -hmm. 90s. And then, of course, I saw, you know, 
the new, you know, trilogy as it was. And I love the idea of having Star Wars, but to end it, you know, and I think this is the ending of the Skywalker saga, but what, what what I love what I love about this is this is what when when we and I remember being a kid in the eighties I remember reading yeah. uh, about George Lucas I remember when they when they said that Star Wars was Episode four and and that it was actually four yeah. five and six and that there were there was plans for a nine I mean we knew in the eighties when I went to junior high or high school we were talking about the fact that there's going to be three and uh, I mean I originally I think the interviews with George Lucas yeah the the three the three trilogies were going to be unrelated from each other. They weren't going to tie in the way they have, but I, I'm so excited mm. to see this because this is literally a, you know, yeah. uh, you know, 40 years, 30, some uh, almost 40 years yeah. in the making. This is my general, this is my, our generation, yeah. Mark and I, uh, especially, uh, this is, we've, we've seen this. I was seven when the original one came out. Like I said, my parents, yeah, were, uh, you, I'm, I'm so jealous now of your parents letting you go see it when you were five, Mark, because I was seven and they wouldn't <laughs> let me go see it. And my brothers and sisters, I remember my brothers and sisters coming <laughs> home and so excited about this marvelous movie they saw. And I couldn't see it until uh, two years later. I think when we finally got a VHS copy of it, but no. uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, we all grew up on this. And that's the yeah. whole thing. And, and so seeing to see it end to see this number nine, I'm just, uh, I, I'm excited. I'm excited and upset at the same yeah. time, and that's the well, whole. The universe thing. is going to continue. And we've got the Mandalorian. Yeah, we're, it, we're it will. Have more yeah, and, and, and more things, but it is it is the end of a uh, of an era. It is an end of a. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, obviously, everybody out there, watch <laughs> the Mandalorian, and please. Mm -hmm. Go listen to Podcastica's House Podcastica, please, because they are amazing. Jason, Richard, who's the other guy? Chris. Is it Chris? <laughs> Jason, or is it Chris? Jason, Chris? Richard, and Chris? That's horrible. That's terrible. I, I, can't remember. So. I just I just sent those guys a voicemail this week as well. Um, yeah, but I, I usually say yeah. Jason and the other guys. So I always send them feedback. I actually sent them feedback and they played it this week on a voicemail. So if you go out there and you love The Mandalorian, go listen to House Podcastica. And if you have any feedback for any of The Mandalorian episodes, send them to House Podcastica. So that would actually wrap up into what we are talking about and then we go into what we call send feedback to yes send us feedback please please you can send us feedback to our you can uh, <laughs> uh, go to our website panels to pixels .com. that will redirect you to our facebook group which is facebook.com slash panels to pixels every week we put up a post there telling you what we're going to be talking about and you can post any feedback there you can also email us at panels to pixels one at gmail.com that's panels to pixels one the two is right there in the middle spelled out to and the one is the number one at gmail.com you can also call us and leave us a voicemail at 845-350-2095 Five. And you can hear us on Spotify, Google Play, Apple iTunes, and whatever podcast player of choice you use. If that plod, plod, podcast, podcast, yeah. If that podcast <laughs> player of choice allows you to leave us a review, please go ahead and do that. Leave us a five star review, and we will read it here uh, on the air. Kyle, tell us where you can be heard. Well, you can hear me on the uh, well coming up on the Walking Dead talk through for the. Um, Back half of the season 10 start of The Walking Dead at talkthroughmedia.com. Uh, and also I do uh, co-host on Fear the Walking Dead talk through and we'll be doing the new spinoff with uh, the new Walking Dead World Beyond. So Sweet. So you are yes. going to do, do a podcast yes. over it. Nice. Is that going to be on Talk yes, Through Media? Sweet. And I'm not sure if I might have Mark <laughs> or it's probably either going to be me and mark or uh mark and brian or me and brian so but yeah i i want to cover it so i will be doing that <laughs> 
I'm interested in. I want to see anything Walking Dead. I don't care if it's angsty teens. I don't think it's going to be angsty teens. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think it's going to be a good show no matter what. I agree. <laughs> All right. Awesome. So we'd like to send out a special thanks to Kirk Manley for our artwork for our podcast. Our plug for Kirk would be check out Kirk Manley on his website, www.studiokm.com. Or you could reach him at Twitter, at BatmanKM, Instagram, at BatmanKM. Check out his artwork at BatmanKM.DeviantArt.com. If you have something that you would like to hire Kirk to make for you, or, you know, can sign for, you can email him at Kirk at StudioKM.com. So, like Kyle stated before... We are part of the Talk Through Media Network. And obviously, Panels of Pixels is on the Next Level Podcast Network. So we invited uh, Kyle in because he's a great friend and we love him and we love his input. So, as he spoke before, I am the co host of The Walking Dead Talk Through with Brian Malosh on Talk Through Media and we review The Walking Dead Talk Through, uh, The Walking Dead each week, actually. So this show will stay on the Next Level Podcast Network, but there will be a link for the Talk Through Media for others to listen to as well. So listen to us on TalkThroughMedia.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. We could currently be working on a lot of things, actually. There's a lot going on. The Picard cast is going on, so Brian's going to be doing that. So keep in touch here or go to TalkThroughMedia.com. And you can hear you can hear me right here, of course. But also, I send in uh, voicemails to various other podcasts. We do recommend any of the podcasts on the Next Level Podcast Network. Specifically, I'll put in a plug right here for DC Prime Time, which both Mark and I sent voicemails to for their crisis uh, for their covering of Crisis of the first three uh, episodes of Crisis on Infinite Earths, 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 <laughs> uh, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, which leads us into what we're going to be doing next. And uh, I believe next week, Mark and I will be talking about the the first three parts of Crisis on Infinite Earths as well. Or we may wait a week with Christmas coming up. We'll see how, how those things go. Pay attention to the Facebook page, and we will let you know for sure what's coming up for next week. Exactly. So thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And I'm Kyle. And this was Panels of Pixels. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.